Uh, Luke 23, 26 through 38. Luke 23. Now, as they led him away, our Lord Jesus Christ, they laid hold of a certain man, Simon of Cyrene, who was coming from the country, and on him they laid the cross that he might bear it after Jesus. And a great multitude of the people followed him, and women who also mourned and lamented him. And Jesus, turning to them, said, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For indeed the days are coming in which they will say, Blessed are the barren wombs that never bore and breasts which never nursed. Then they will begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills, Cover us. For if they do these these things in the greenwood, what will be done in the dry? There were also two others, criminals, led with him to be put to death. And when they had come to the place called Calvary, there they crucified him, and the criminals on the right hand and the other on the left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. And they divided their garments and cast lots. They divided his garments and cast lots. And the people stood looking on, but even the rulers with them sneered, saying, He saved others. (laughs) Let him save himself, if he is the Christ, the chosen of God. And the soldiers also mocked him, coming and offering him sour wine, and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. And an inscription also was written over him in letters of Greek, Latin, and Hebrew. This is the King of the Jews. Thank you for standing in honor of God's word. You may be seated. One of my favorite sculptures of Michelangelo is the Pieta, the one where Mary is holding in her lap the crucified Son of God, her Son. And it is, of course, a very famous uh, sculpture by Michelangelo. And it's there in St. Peter's Basilica, and this one couple from America went to visit, and um, there was a hush on the part of those who were with them as they toured through St. Peter's Basilica. And um, John and Loretta Reynolds were in awe as they looked at this sculpture. And the silence was broken by a little girl who, just coming up, looked at the statue and said, Mommy, what have they done to Jesus? And her mother tried to calm her. She was only about six years old. She says, No, Mommy, what have they done to Jesus? And the Reynolds said they just stood there in awe as they realized we crucify the creator of the universe when Jesus died on the cross for our sins. We crucified the Son of God. What have we done to Jesus? Is the real question. As we look at this familiar passage, and it's recorded in all four Gospels, we're going to look at it in Luke, Uh, especially because he has more to say about the thief thief on the cross that I believe was saved, and you probably do too. We want to look at this particular passage of the four Gospels for that reason, as well as several others, but, you know, they can become familiar passages to us, and if we're not careful, uh, the cross can become too familiar. We may wear it as jewelry. We pass by it on churches. Of course, it's been in the news the last few years as there are are people in this country who want them all taken down because it's an offense to them as atheists that the cross is there. Also, of course, it's an offense to some of the major world religions. Big time offense is the crucifixion of the Lord of glory. But we might take it for granted. And I hope this morning as we get into this passage, we will think about our sins put Jesus on the cross. And Mary was at the foot of the cross. And she may have held him before Joseph took him and buried him. 
in his tomb. But she would have only held him for a short period of time. And we'll examine that possibility uh, in just a little bit. We may have to read between the lines, but it's very poignant indeed. And I hope that we have time to do that. But let's, let's get into the passage and realize that, you know, as we continue through Route 66, we're looking at the chronology of the New Testament. And, and we do come early because Easter is not for another month and a half. We come early to scenes we usually study or understand at Easter time. And Bible Fellowship Church, Lord willing, will have a Good Friday service. And it will be examined again this day and the crucifixion of our Lord from a different angle. And so will the resurrection which Jason in two weeks is going to preach on. Uh, But in the meantime, uh, we want you to get ready. It's it's our desire, Jason and I talked about this this week, and we're praying this, that that in fact getting ready early because it fits into the chronology of Route 66 will cause you to begin to pray for people you want to invite on either Good Friday or Easter Sunday. People you've been praying for, maybe have shared Christ with, or want to share Christ with that you might bring them, and that their hearts might be prepared because you prayed a month and a half ahead of time to accept your invitation to to bring them so they can hear the truth. Do not expect the average person on the street or your neighbor to understand the cross of Christ because you do. If anything, in a post-Christian culture in America, it's understood less and less. And therefore, the challenge for us as believers, especially, is to bring a clear understanding of what Jesus Christ did when he went to the cross to die for our sins. And I hope toward that end, it is my prayer toward that end, that this this study this morning will help you do exactly that. So we looked at the first part of this passage. It goes on uh, the rest of the crucifixion scene uh, until we get to Uh, actually to about verse 54, uh, and then uh, it transitions to the burial of Jesus and so on. And the two are really, really tied together. It's obvious from from the the narrative that is here that that is the case. But we ask a question this morning um, that I think is important for us to ask, and and that is, um, uh, well, first let's look at the map. I like maps. You know I like maps. People say, well, you're more of a teacher than a preacher, and I consider that, by the way, a a real compliment. But, you know, where was Jesus Christ crucified? Well, here's a picture in this map of of where Calvary was. And this is the old city walls right here, ran along this way and down here to the old city, the part that's called the City of David down in this area, and then on around and on up, and that's all the boundary it was. And this was outside the city walls, this being one of the main gates into the city. The, um, the place where he was tried by the Roman court was up here. Uh, it says there's Herod's temple here. And of course, this is the, up in this area, this is the temple mount where the temple proper is. But above that is the fortress of Antonio. And that is where um, he was tried by Pilate. And so the Via Dolorosa, so we, we, we have it uh, there today when you go to Jerusalem and you can walk it. It's probably pretty accurate to the route, but you come down this way and you come around and you go over here. And now there's a big basilica here, a big, a big uh, church called the Church of the Holy Sepulchre because uh, they, they believe it's over the site of Calvary and also over the site of the tomb that Jesus was buried in. And they're probably pretty accurate archaeologically. Now, everybody likes to go up to Gordon's tomb and, and see the, the side of the mountain, and it looks like a skull, and they, they believe that could also be uh, Golgotha, uh, which is, by the way, the um, Aramaic term for it. But it's up here, north of the old city wall, up in this area right here. It's not far away from here, but I believe this is actually where it was because that, that was a main thoroughfare into the city, and the whole point of crucifixion was to intimidate the people that are subjected to Roman rule. Uh, the more grisly it was, the more heinous it was, the less likely you, a non-citizen of Rome, would want to cross the Roman law, the Roman governor, or the Roman army, and you would obey. 
So they wanted it to be as ugly as possible, and so they crucified people regularly there. It wasn't a, a hill used for the first time. It was a hill used over and over and over again, perhaps stained with the blood of hundreds, if not thousands, of criminals to the state. Jesus was categorized such, even though, as we saw last week in the, the different trials of Jesus, that uh, there was no fault found in Jesus by Pilate. There was no fault fault found by Herod in, in Jesus, uh, but still they were afraid of the crowd, so they capitulated. And of course, Pilate famously washed his hands of the situation and gave him to his death squad to appease the Jewish leaders and the crowd of thousands who were crying out for his crucifixion. Now, that very same day, because that was in the early morning, Jesus went down the Via Dolorosa and he went to Calvary and he died for our sins and the crowds followed this was a very public event thousands of people probably were there to eyewitness Jesus's crucifixion this was the time of the Passover in fact they had to get Jesus and those two other criminals quote unquote Jesus of course wasn't but they had to get them down from the cross before sunset on Friday because then it started into the high and holy Sabbath of Passover and we'll see that in just a moment. But here's the deal. Jesus Christ died a very public death. And it is recorded in several places on some inscriptions and whatnot. And of course, the, the very existence of Pilate at that time being governor recently was uncovered in the old part of Jerusalem. And so, you know, the old, uh, the old uh, Critics who said, well, Pilate probably is a fictitious person, and this is a nice story. This probably didn't really happen to Jesus. Well, we now know for sure Pilate was there at this time, a governor of Israel because of an inscription that was found nearby. Besides the fact that, that hundreds of crosses or cross-like uh, figures have been found archaeologically uh, in and around the Holy Land because crucifixion was a grisly fact of life. In fact, Jesus himself, when he was 12 years old, most likely, saw just south of Nazareth over a hundred rebels crucified along the road and, and, and watched, if he got down there, the crows picking the eyes of these crucified men off because the Romans would leave them around in a situation like that and not even bury them, but let the animals... And the predators just eat their bodies and their bones to scare the people into subjection. Jesus saw this. And remember, Jesus was born to die and He knew His fate like that was coming. And that's why, Je that's why God the Father sent Him in the first place. So all of this is, is mixed into the story of the, of, uh, of the cross of Christ. And I want us to see it, if we can, as vividly as possible. But especially through three great stories of three men who I believe came to Christ and accepted Him, if you will, as their Savior on that day. And so who are the first three people to be saved at the cross of Christ is what we want to ask. And, and the answer to that question comes first of all as Simon uh, the Siren, Cyrene. He's of Cyrene. This is, by the way, where Tripoli is today in North Africa. And he was saved on the way to Mount Calvary. Now, before we get a little bit more into this guy, let's, let's look at a slideshow taken from the Passion of the Christ that's very poignant. I know that it seemed as if Mel Gibson bloodied Jesus up more than was necessary, but I think it comes close to the truth. And I like this slideshow. It's only about four minutes long, but it'll remind us of the garden and the trials and the Via Dolorosa and his crucifixion and at the very end, his resurrection.
try to put myself in Simon's place. I said he's from where Tripoli is today, and um, I just wonder, you know, he, he comes from a country far away. He comes for the Passover, probably a once-in-a-lifetime journey. He comes to, to participate in the sacrifice on the mountain, maybe to purchase a lamb without blemish, to be sacrificed in his place there on the altar in front of the temple. He has to be clean to come to that. In fact, now they have discovered over 50 mikvahs that are around the temple that uh, people would go down into and do a self-baptism before they went up on the mountain uh, of the temple mount to, 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 to give their animal sacrifices for their sins. Now, he comes face to face with the actual Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And he knows that if he gets involved with this, He's going to be ceremonially unclean and cannot participate in what he has saved for years to go on this trip to Jerusalem from Tripoli, from Cyrene. He doesn't know anything about Jesus. This may be his first confrontation and he's heard maybe a little bit of a buzz because Jesus had raised Lazarus from the dead the week before and the whole city was a buzz about that, but he had no understanding yet of who this Jesus was when he was pressed into service to take the cross and carry it for Jesus the rest of the way to Calvary. I like that in Mel Gibson's movie, he shows the change that takes place in Simon toward the Lord. Shaking off all of his resentment and his anger that his whole trip is being ruined because he has been made ceremonially unclean, which takes well over a week to get over and it, all of those events of Passover would be gone by then. And that he began to realize this is what it's all about. Now, I, I, my prayer as I was preparing this week for a familiar passage like this is that all of us will become more familiar with it and this week especially to focus on it and prepare our hearts for celebration of Good Friday and Easter in about a month and a half, and that we would learn from here on out the rest of our lives to tell as part of the good news the historicity, the truth of the cross of Jesus Christ and be so familiar with this coin that we'll have confidence to share it with everyone that we meet. What should hold us back except Satan? What should hold us back? from sharing the good news of Jesus. We know we need to do it with respect for those we share it with and with uh, meekness in our attitude, but we need to know it. We need to understand it. It needs to get into the very fabric of our hearts and our being, and then we need to share the good news that Jesus died for our sins because that's the core of the gospel. And of course, then he resurrected guaranteeing that his death has po the power to save people from their sins and give them eternal life. So si Simon did come to salvation in Jesus because we do meet him again in Scripture. And in fact, um, we read in Isaiah 53 these words about what he witnessed. And he himself started out despising Jesus as he was forced to carry that cross. He, he is despised and rejected by men a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised and we did not esteem him in the movie, The Passion of the Christ. He's got his little boy with him and this bloody mess comes by him there on the Via Dolorosa and he hides his eyes with his hands and pushes him back into the crowd to his mother because he doesn't want him to see this, this, this horrible sight. And yet later in the Gospels, and in the New Testament, we read about his sons. We'll see that in just a moment and how they were instrumental as leaders in the early church. But of course, all that's transpiring and he's, he's learning and understanding as he goes. Surely he, he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. A prophecy given over 800 years before it came to pass in detail on that fateful day, the most important day in the history of the world, the hinge of history is the cross of Christ. 
The hinge of history is this day, around 30 A.D., in the spring, when Jesus died for us. And then Mark is the only gospel that records this, but he records in 1531 in connection with this scene. Then they compelled a certain man, Simon, a Cyrenian, the father of Alexander and Rufus. Those were his sons. I wonder which one of those little boys it was that he hid his eyes from seeing Jesus crucified that day. As he was coming out of the country and passing by to bear the cross. In the book of Acts, these guys will come up again. And specifically at the end of the book of Romans, Rufus will be remembered, the same man who was the son of Joseph, of uh, Simon. So I believe Simon was saved that day and he began to follow Jesus that day and he raised his family as Christians that they too might follow Jesus from that day forward. So amazing things happened there on the Via Dolorosa with Simon from Tripoli. And there we have in Romans, greet Rufus, chosen in the Lord and his mother and mine. That's kind of an interesting statement from Paul. I don't understand it. Let you puzzle on that one. But apparently that family had a great connection in Paul's life to encourage his missionary journeys and and the spread of the gospel of Jesus Christ. A very powerful ally was born that day when Jesus died on Mount Calvary. So what kind of application can we make from, from this portion of our Narrative here in Luke 23. I I thought of this one. Get close to the cross of Christ and stay close in it. Always remember that it was there that our Lord paid for your sins and be thankful. Raise your children and your grandchildren accordingly as well so that they can grow up like Rufus and Alexander. That's a good thing to do. So I pray this now for our six grandchildren, that they would grow up like Rufus and Alexander, make a difference for Jesus in the world. But the second thing we see from this passage is the thief on the cross was saved before he breathed his last. Now this one really is deserving of much meditation. And we come to uh, Luke's rendition of this is more precise than the rest of the gospel writers but it says in verse 33 well first of all 32 it says they uh, there were also two others criminals led with him to be put to death and 33 this is the whole statement by the way of the crucifixion we make more out of it but uh, luke simply says and when they had come to the place called calvary there they crucified him and the criminals on one hand and the other One on the right and one on the left. Now, so has established a contrast of a spiritual kind, a real happening in history, real time and space. Our Lord was crucified on this little knoll called Calvary or Golgotha, the place of the skull in Aramaic. And there he had a criminal on one side and the other, and he was taking the place of Barabbas, the leader of the criminals and rebellionists who had been released the night before by Pilate at the crowd's insistence. That middle cross had been reserved for Barabbas, a murderer. One of them believes. The other rejects Christ. And so we see uh, an object lesson, if you will, in the cross, the three crosses, what's happened for the last 2,000 years. There are people who are skeptics and will go to their grave rejecting Jesus Christ as their Savior. And then there are people who maybe even in the 11th hour, maybe even at 11.59 in their life, will receive Jesus as their Savior and be in heaven. And And so we follow the story. It says here then, Christ was crucified and and i'll say just a few things about the crucifixion you see the cross you you've seen pictures you saw in this slideshow the nails going into his hands the nails going into his feet 
This was literal, of course, because in his resurrection body, when his disciples didn't believe, he showed them the scars of the nails pounded into his hand, already healed in his resurrection and also in his feet. But of course, it's very excruciating pain initially. But when that goes numb, you're on the cross and you're in a bent position, so you constantly have to push up against the nails in your legs and even those in your hands to raise yourself to get air into your lungs in order to survive. And you can go on like that for days until you finally die of thirst, of dehydration. And so that's the way they crucified people. And that's the way these three were crucified. Then verse 34, Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. He was saying this of the the death squad. Now, they had these these group of soldiers. Usually, there was a centurion in charge of the death squad, but they did so much crucifying of people to intimidate their subjugated uh, uh, nations that they rose up within the army all over the Roman Empire, death squads to do this very dastardly deed. And the Romans themselves, back in Rome, were disgusted at this practice. Cicero said it is the most horrible thing that you can possibly imagine. Something that a good Roman citizen wants nothing to do with. And of course, if you are a citizen and you're, you're sentenced to death, you do not die this death. Citizens got beheaded, a merciful way of capital punishment, but everybody else who crossed the Romans was crucified. So there were death squads that did this with great regularity, and they had nailed Jesus to the cross, and he said, as he looked down upon them and upon the high priest and all the priesthood who had gotten the crowd built up to cry, crucify him, release for us Barabbas, and crucify him, Jesus And he says, Father, forgive them, for they don't realize what they're doing. Driven, certainly, by Satan, as well as their own sin nature. Verse 35. And the people stood looking on. But even the rulers with with them, with the people, were sneering, saying, He saved others, let him save himself, if he is the Christ, the chosen of God. And the soldiers also mocked him, coming and offering him sour wine, and saying to him, You are the king of the Jews. Save yourself. You see, Jesus was under great derision. Not only physical pain, but great derision. By the way, we put a loincloth over Jesus, but they always crucified naked to bring greater shame on the subject who was dying this horrible death. So there he is exposed. Exposed to everyone, including his mother, and his followers, and only the women, and John had the courage to be near enough to the cross to be an eyewitness of what went on. So much so that in John, when Mary is down almost at the very foot of the cross, and Jesus is breathing his last, one of his last sayings was to John, John, behold your mother. Mary, behold your son. And he was handing off the responsibility for her well-being the rest of her life to his youngest disciple, to John. But there they were close to the cross and the only ones, the only ones from what we can tell from the accounts who wasn't sneering and jeering and making fun of Jesus there on the cross. And then I believe Pilate put the king of the Jews not as a mocking thing, and he did it in three languages, the three main languages in that part of the world at that time, the language spoken by the Romans, and of course Greek, the lingua franca of that time, and Hebrew. And he wanted everybody to be able to read, this is Jesus, the King of the Jews. I think he had some question in his mind as to whether or not that wasn't really true. And so he had it done. He also, of course, wanted to give the religious leaders the heebie-jeebies by doing so. But there it was, and it was true. Jesus was the king of the Jews. Now we get in verse 39 to the the two thieves on either side. Then one of the criminals who were hanged blasphemed him, saying, if you are the Christ, save yourself and save us. 
But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Do not even fear, do you not even fear God, seeing you are under the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. This thief on the cross accepted, if you will, Jesus as his Lord and Savior on the cross before he died. And Jesus promised him paradise. Now, understand, this is about the middle of the six-hour ordeal. And probably by this time, of course, darkness has fallen from noon to three. And Matthew records there was a great earthquake at that time. Luke doesn't mention that. But then the the temple um, curtain between the Holy of Holies and the holy place in the temple was torn from top to bottom. By the way, those curtains went up higher than the ceiling. To be torn from top to bottom has to be a supernatural thing. And they're very heavy and thick curtains. For it to be torn at all is a supernatural thing. Of course, it was saying, God was saying in that phenomena that my son in his work on the cross is opening up heaven so that those who accept him as their Lord and Savior can come and go with freedom, something that was not true before that moment, before his finished work on the cross. But there on the cross, the thief said, Lord, consider me when you come into your kingdom. And he didn't know what else to say. And that was good enough for Jesus because he believed that Jesus was the King of kings and the Lord of Lords. He even rebuked the other thief, reminded him that they deserve death, but Jesus did not. Now, I never really thought about it when I was growing up, but I knew the Scripture said that uh, when Jesus had breathed his last, the authorities wanted the other two men killed with the breaking of their legs. They wanted Jesus killed too, but they discovered he was already dead because he had given up his own life. It was not taken from him. And he had prophesied that, prophesied that many times earlier. But they took the same hammer, which is like a sledge, that they had pounded the nails into the hands of these three men. And they came along and broke their legs right here at the knee. Just crack, crack. So they could no longer push up and get air in their lungs. So the last thing of pain that this thief on the cross, we do not know his name, was to hear crack, crack, and terrible pain. And he couldn't no longer push to get breath, and then he suffocated. Can you think of any worse death than suffocation? All of this happened after Jesus said, today you will be with me in paradise. And then, can you imagine him waking up with Jesus in paradise? Have you ever thought about that? Now, what is paradise? Is that heaven? Well, we understand from the Scriptures in several places that before the finished work of Jesus on the cross, that those souls from the Old Testament times who look forward to the coming of the Messiah and His salvation when they died went to paradise or Abraham's bosom to wait the events of the cross in order to be released to go in front of a holy Father in heaven because Jesus' blood cleansed them from all unrighteousness. And so that day, we know Jesus went to that place and He took those prisoners, we're told in other Scriptures, and He took them to heaven. So that thief got to go to paradise and see what that was all about and then go with Jesus to heaven to be in heaven for eternity. Amen? All because of a simple profession of faith in Jesus. That His death had power to save Him from his sins. That's the good news. That's what we get to share. And with people who don't know Jesus, they are headed where that other criminal went. We saw in the story of Lazarus, which I do not believe is a parable, and that's also recorded only in Luke. And he tells us that when Lazarus died, this this, this beggar who, who even ate the crumbs with the dogs under the table, and he died, he went to Abraham's bosom because he was a believer in the coming Messiah, just an Old Testament saint. And then He looked across this great abyss of fire and flame and he saw on the other side in hell, he saw Lazarus, who by this time is tormented, cannot 
even stand to swallow because he's so thirsty. He says, God, would you see, Lazarus is over there. Would you have him come and bring me a little bit of water? And the Lord says, no, it's too late, Lazarus. He says, will you at least have him go back and tell my brother that this is not where he wants to be for eternity? And the Lord says, no, it's too late. It's too late. And so there was a thief in Hades. And on the other side for a while, there was this criminal. This is one of his friends, his buddies in crime. And he looks across the abyss and he says, I believe. My heart breaks for you. But it's too late. You would not confess the Lord of glory on the cross as I did. See, folks, those are the stakes. Those are the stakes. Do I believe the story I told you? Well, the Bible tells it. I believe the Bible. Do you believe the Bible? Why can't we tell that to people who need Jesus? Why do we keep silent? We must share the good news of Jesus. We must talk about the cross. And you don't have to get as emotional as me, by the way. I'm just emotional at this point. But we cannot be guilty of silence. I'm trying to to spur on the faithful in this whole story. Well, here's the second person now. In that very same day in which Jesus was crucified, who came to know Him as their Savior and Lord. And then we see how important it is, therefore. How important it is to pray for people and not give up on them. How, how, how we should, should, should remember them. And uh, we should be careful to um, share with them the good news. By the way, I think one of the greatest ways to share the good news is, the, is a kind of an apologetic way, and that is to go to a passage like Psalm 22 where it says specifically what's going to happen on the cross a thousand years before it happened. And uh, David wrote this Psalm 16-18. through 18. He says, For dogs have surrounded me from the perspective of the Messiah, from Jesus' perspective. The congregation of the wicked has enclosed me. They've pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. They look and they stare at me. They divide my garments among them. And for my clothing, they cast lots. And we see that recorded right here in the passage before us in Luke. It's so important for us to remember to share the good news about Jesus Christ in some detail. Because this is us spiritually. Prisoners, according to Paul, The moment we receive Jesus as our Lord and Savior, released from a prison that would just take us straight to hell. So remember that it's never too late for someone to come to Jesus and accept Him as their Lord and Savior. Keep on praying and keep on sharing the good news until you see them saved. These are people that God has put in your path. They are family. They are friends. They are neighbors. They are co-workers. They are fellow students. You name it. People all around us need Jesus. Are we praying for their salvation? Is it a regular course of our prayer life? Don't give up. This thief came to Christ at the very last hour, literally, of his life. And he was in paradise with Jesus. Lastly, the centurion. I believe he was saved at the foot of the cross as our Lord breathed his last. And we see this uh, especially in verses 44 and following. So there's Christ on the cross. He's dying for our sins. Verse 44, now it was about the sixth hour. There was darkness over the earth until the ninth hour. And the sun was darkened and the veil of the temple was torn in two. And when Jesus had cried out with a loud voice, He said, Father, into Your hands I commit My spirit. Having said this, He breathed His last and then Luke immediately takes his pen and writes these words in verse 47. So then the centurion saw what had happened. He glorified God, saying, certainly this was a righteous man. Mark says, certainly this is the Son of God. And the whole crowd who came together in that sight, seeing what had been done, beat their breasts and returned. They were in mourning over what they had done. Many of them had screamed earlier in the day, crucify Him! Now they have seen Him die with dignity. They have seen what has happened to Him. They have seen this drama unfold. They realize they killed an innocent man and they go away in mourning, beating their breasts in sorrow. 
And this Roman pagan, this, this leader of a death squad, having probably witnessed thousands of these crucifixions, is broken. He sees the phenomena of the darkness. He feels the earthquake. He sees the fear of the crowd around him and is fearful himself. And he realizes this truly is no normal man. This must be the Son of God. And I believe that he would have to stay and clean up the mess that was part of the job of the death squad. And so when Joseph of Arimathea came with the writ from Pilate, give this body to Joseph so he can bury Jesus, he, I believe, helped Joseph get him down off the cross so that he could take him to his own tomb, which was probably no more than a half a block or less away because his life had been changed. You see, we have an opportunity here, folks, to tell the good news. And we can be confident that this really happened, that this really happened in history, and that Jesus Christ came once and for all to die for our sins. And, and we can talk about people like Simon, and we can talk about people like the thief on the cross, and we can talk about people like this hard-nosed Roman. And, and, and the Romans were hard-nosed. Their culture was a culture of violence, a culture of selfishness. Think of the arenas in which they saw gladiators kill one another. And think of the lions who killed and ate their prisoners, especially the Christians, over the next two centuries. Think of a people who wanted to see spectacles like that who longed for them, who were bloodthirsty for them. That was the culture of the Romans. That was the background of this man, this centurion. And yet his, his life just was turned upside down. And there was a transformation as he came to Christ. So, so you have a, a skeptic, uh, don't get me ceremonially unclean person in Simon coming to know Jesus. You have a, a thief, probably a murderer, hanging on the cross, turning to Jesus and saying, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus says, you'll be with me in paradise today. And you have this centurion, this rough and ready, hard, bitten man, so used to death and death and more death. And all of a sudden, his heart has changed and melted by what he saw on the cross when Jesus died for his sins. See, that's the story of the cross. That's what we need to, to think about this week and meditate on. And then, then I would beg of you, all of us, including myself, this is for me as well, that you would write down some names of folks you want to share the good news of Jesus Christ with and, 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 and invite them to the, the Good Friday service in a month and a half. Invite them to the Easter Sunday service where they'll hear the gospel again through those two services so they might be saved. This is a, a sermon especially for believers. And come Good Friday and Easter, it'll be especially for sinners that you bring to hear the message. But you, yourself, be prepared to share this good news in its entirety with others the rest of your life or until Jesus comes again. And of course, if you're here today and you've not accepted Jesus as your Savior, now's a good time to do that. I want to close this service mainly with that prayer, so let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I just uh, want to ask you to work on the hearts of anyone in this room who has not yet received Jesus as their Lord and Savior and cause them to realize Jesus died there on that cross 2,000 years ago for their sins. Their sins were nailed into the cross of Jesus there. But they must by faith confess their sins and by faith receive Jesus as their Lord and Savior. And I pray, Lord, that if they want to do that before they leave this place, they'll come to the prayer room in the back of the worship center here and meet with me and so I can share with them again from Your Word how they can be born again. Lord, I pray for all of us who have put our faith in Jesus that we would get real these next two months as we approach Easter and Good Friday, and really make this a fruitful time to see our, our neighbors and our family members and our co-workers and our fellow students 
and the people that we have as friends who do not yet know Jesus as their Savior come to know Him as their Lord and Savior. For these things we pray in Jesus' name and all of God's children said, Amen. Amen. God bless you. Walk worthy of your calling this week in Christ. Meditate on the cross for your own growth in Jesus and also for the sharing of the good news with others.